So it's now time to look at this AT&T PC6300. It's not really that special of a computer. It's a fairly vanilla 8086 based PC like a thousand others from the time period. There are a couple of weird proprietary design decisions that they made on some of the interfaces that are somewhere between interesting and just a pain in the behind. Now this particular computer is interesting to me because at my first job out of high school, I worked doing data entry at the Soil Conservation Service. And in our office, we had an AT&T 3B2 Unix machine. And connected to that around the office, we had half a dozen or so terminals. There was a couple of kind of oddball Tektronics terminals, and there was three or four of these that were configured to boot straight away into Kermit or some other kind of terminal program. I really don't remember which. It was a shocking number of years ago. The terminal on my desk was actually one of the tech terminals which could do graphics, and so I geeked out on that. But these were interesting because they had a floppy drive and I could use that to transfer bin utils, gas, GCC, and a whole slew of other GNU software onto the 3B2 and spend unimaginable hours trying to get all of that stuff built on a really, really primitive Unix machine. So let's dig into it. Let's play with some at and PC weird stuff. One thing I noticed right away is how nice the case looks. It's a bit dirty, but there's no scratches, dings, or yellowing. Little foot pads on the bottom will need replacing at some point, but they're fine for now. We got our first view of the power supply fan. Why does it stick out so much? The back is where things start to get weird. Flathead screws. Why did it have to be flathead screws? That's the video connector on the far right. I'll talk more about the display adapter later. Once we get past the giant protruding fan, we can see the keyboard connector, completely non-standard. I have the matching keyboard, and it has a cool feature that I'll talk about much later. Finally, the serial and parallel port, they seem oddly upside down. The screws are flathead, which is annoying, but there is a clever feature here. Screws don't actually come out. They're locked into the case, and that means I can't lose them. Inside the case, we see not very much. The display adapter and the hard drive controller are present, but there's no computer. It turns out the motherboard is mounted underneath. Loosen a couple more screws. Flip the computer over. And with an embarrassing amount of difficulty, remove the bottom of the case. Now the motherboard can be accessed. There's a lot of stuff on this motherboard, but the main thing I was worried about was the CMOS battery. And it doesn't look too bad. Getting closer, some crumbs of battery leakage are present, but there's no obvious damage. Many apologies for the horrible focus in this part. Unfortunately, this is the one part of the video that I couldn't refilm. First things first, that nasty old battery has got to go. Thank you. 
The leakage on the board is so minimal that applying vinegar to neutralize the alkaline solution doesn't result in any fizzing or foaming. The inverted motherboard may have saved the day. While there was almost no damage on the motherboard itself, there is a gaping sore on the inside of the case where gravity caused the alkaline solution to dribble down. Now we can get a closer look at the motherboard itself. Here's the 8086 processor, the empty math coprocessor slot. All of the RAM chips are filled in for either 512 or 640K, the BIOS, some miscellaneous connectors and jumper blocks that I'm not sure what they're for yet, the keyboard controller, which is right here near the keyboard port, a miscellaneous cable from the other side, and two edge connectors that connect to the display adapter and the expansion slots some additional unknown jumpers. The PC speaker, which looks suspiciously like a old telephone earpiece, thanks AT&T. There is some model information silk screened onto the motherboard, but nothing that looks like a date code or anything else useful. Before powering this thing up, I want to check the power supply. Given the physical condition of the device, I'm not too worried, but it's worth the extra time to be cautious. Start by disconnecting everything from the power supply. There's a bunch of wires from the power supply to various parts of the system. One connects directly to the video card, a couple attached to the motherboard using screws. And finally, the mystery of the wire connected to the motherboard is solved. It comes from the power supply. And finally, the moment of truth. No smoke, no sparks, no explosions. The power connector to the motherboard should be about 5 volts, and 5.17 is good enough. The connector to the video card, I believe, should be 15 volts, which seems weird and 14.8 seems good enough. And finally, the weird cable that goes around to the bottom side to the motherboard. I spent a long time messing about with this. I had a lot of trouble getting the probes to make contact, and then even when I did, I couldn't get any kind of a useful reading. It's almost as if they know we're coming. I'm sure at this point people are screaming at me through their screens, but I'm going to come back to this thing in a little bit.
The Molex connector to the drives should give 12 volts and 5 volts. Eleven point seven nine, that's good. Five point one four, that's also good. Returning to the nonsense of this other connector, RTFPS, read the fine power supply. It's hard to see on the screen, but engraved on the power supply it says plus twelve V minus twelve V. Let's see what happens when I properly measure these cables independently across ground. Now, the connector is still too small for the probe to fit. Minus 11.97, plus 11.8, that looks close enough to plus and minus 12 volts to me. Reassembly time. Start by reconnecting back together all of the various power cables from around the system. The single Molex connector that goes to a Y cable, the power cable that goes to the display adapter, and then these power cables that connect to the main board by screws. They're actually very irritating. The screws have a washer on them, so it's hard to slip the blade underneath without just completely removing the screws. The first one goes back in pretty easily. But the second one turns out to be a giant hassle. Rewatching this now, I can almost hear circus music playing in the background. The best part is right about now when I drop the screw someplace where my fingers can't reach. Now it's finally time to thread that last cable through to the other side. Now it's not a hundred percent obvious which way is the correct way for this cable to plug into the motherboard, but I have a pretty good idea. So I intentionally try to plug it in the wrong way first just to make sure that it doesn't also fit that way. If it happens to fit both ways then I know I need to go back and check either earlier in the video or in the manual to see what the correct orientation is. Finally, time to power up. So far, everything looks good. I love seeing that stepper motor mechanism moving. In fact, let's take a little closer look at that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. The display adapter is basically a monochrome CGA card. The connector on it provides both power and video to the monitor. The expansion slots are fairly normal 8-bit ISA connectors. Three have extra edge connectors at the far end which provide an extra 8 bits of data. The only card that makes use of this is a memory board that provides extra low memory. Now a proper power on with everything reassembled. Great success.
it seems the RAM added on the motherboard does bring it up to the full 640K. I find it odd that there's basically nothing on here. It's just a bare DOS installation. When I purchased this computer at an estate sale, I searched high and low for disks, manuals, or any other accessories, but I didn't find anything. Now the keyboard does have one final secret. On the back is an extra nine pin connector for a mouse. Now, I don't know if that justifies the non-standard keyboard connector, but it's a nice idea. Well, that went about as well as anyone could have hoped. Unsurprisingly, the battery had leaked a little bit, but the damage was just non-existent. I mean, when I put vinegar on the little bits of the alkaline solution that had come out of the battery, there wasn't even any fizzing. I suspect I'll probably do another video about this computer where I will do some upgrades to it and maybe some other things. I would really love to try to hack together some kind of a, a mouse to interface with the, the special mouse port. I still have to do some research to find out how that mouse port works and, and see if I can interface something to that. Most computers from this time period all use a pretty similar, simple mouse interface where there's a, a pin for up, a pin for down, a pin for left, a pin for right, and then a pin for each of the buttons. And as you move in any of the directions, it ticks on the up, down, left, right lines. And when you click one of the mouse buttons, it ticks that line. So it should be pretty easy, if that's the kind of interface, to cobble together something that just routes wires from an Amiga mouse or a Microsoft bus mouse or something like that to that interface. The more tricky bit, I think, is going to be finding the special mouse interface software. According to the service manual that I've been perusing, all 634 pages of the PDF, which I'll link in the description below, there's a lot of information about how to load and configure the software. Um, so I'm expecting that I'll need to find something special to use it. It's probably on the internet somewhere, but maybe not. There's certainly not any of the mice or any of the software available on eBay because I checked. So it may prove to be tricky. But until then, I'll leave this thing as it is, and I'll find some other weird stuff to play with.